1994, the Florida panther was facing extinction. Down from a population as high as 50,000 panthers 500 years ago, there were only about 24 living individuals. They suffered from low fertility, heart defects, poor immunity, and other recessive genetic problems. Adult and kitten survival were low, and things were not looking good for these amazing predators. But how did things get so dire? First, the Florida panther is actually a subspecies, a distinct population of puma concolor. The broader species' common names include panther, puma, mountain lion, catamount, cougar, cucaguanada, yaguati, and at least 40 others, but not bobcat. Part of the reason puma concolor has so many common names is that its vast historical range overlapped with many different indigenous and settler communities. Now, zooming in, like humans, each puma has two alleles, or versions, of DNA at every location in its genome, one from each parent. This combination of around 4.8 billion nucleotides is entirely unique to each individual, which we'll represent with this pink color on Puma 1. Let's say Puma 2 is about a quarter of 1% different on average, meaning it has about 12 million sequence differences from Puma 1. Imagine these two meet and have a kitten. Their offspring has a combination of each parent's genes. Now, let's imagine a whole population of pumas living 500 years ago and visualize just their genomes moving around the landscape. More distinct colors represent more DNA differences. Over time, some individuals die of old age, but there are also selection pressures such as challenges from nature like drought or from competition. Say that DNA sequences shown in blue have a defect in their immunity. During a disease outbreak, these individuals die and their genes are removed from the population. Having a large, connected population means more genetic variation, that is, more DNA sequence differences between individuals shown here as the range of colors. This variation makes it much more likely that some individuals will survive any challenge, reproduce, and the population will persist. Puma survived and evolved like this for thousands of years in the presence of Native American societies. When European settlers began to expand into eastern North America, they targeted pumas for hunting. But nearly as effective as direct hunting was clearing of habitat. The creation of road here breaks up the habitat. Clearing a forest over there reduces cover. Fast forward to modern times, we have transformed this continuous forest habitat into a fragmented and dangerous patchwork. The few remaining individuals in each patch are left with little choice but to mate with closely related individuals called inbreeding. At this point, the population is susceptible to what ecologists call the extinction vortex. This is a model that describes how small populations are increasingly likely to go extinct over time. After centuries of targeted hunting and habitat loss, the entire eastern puma population was reduced to about 24 genetically similar inbred individuals in Florida. In this small of a population, any random death has a big impact. And in inbred populations, selection against one set of genes can drastically reduce the population. As the population shrinks, the slide towards extinction accelerates, seemingly unavoidably. This is what was happening to the Florida panthers in the 1990s. So what could be done to save the Florida panther? Genetic rescue to the rescue? The idea behind genetic rescue is to bring in individuals from a more genetically distinct population, in our case, to mate with endangered Florida panthers. The resulting offspring will gain new alleles that improve survival and reproduction rates. And over a few generations, this more genetically diverse population will thrive and grow. But what could go wrong? Well, introduced panthers might be more aggressive and kill or outcompete the local panthers. It could also be that when local and introduced panthers mate, their hybrid offsprings are poorly adapted to the local environment. This worst case scenario has happened. The alpine ibex that used to roam all over Europe was hunted down to the last 100 or so individuals by the early 1800s. To try to bring them back using genetic rescue, a few surviving alpine ibex were introduced to some mountains in Slovakia. To increase genetic variation in the alpine ibex, individuals of two other related species were also introduced. However, these species were adapted to much warmer southern climates. This turned out to be important. You see, alpine ibex are adapted to high mountain habitats and they breed in winter so their offsprings are born in the summer. Instead, the hybrids of cold and warm adapted goat species bred at the wrong time of the year. Their kids were born in the dead of winter and did not survive. This is how genetic rescue failed and alpine ibex in Slovakia went extinct twice. But doing nothing is also risky. The Florida panthers were almost certainly headed for extinction in the 1990s. Today, it's estimated that 26% of mammal species are threatened with extinction. 
For amphibians, that number is a staggering 41% with many of them facing similar problems of small population sizes, habitat fragmentation, and inbreeding. Before we try genetic rescue, we'd like to ensure success by answering some basic questions. For example, how many individuals to introduce? Where should the individuals come from? But how do we study genetic rescue without risking a species extinction? One way is to use a model organism, aka model systems, to study a problem when it's risky or impossible to study in a target organism. For example, because we can't ethically experiment on humans, we often use rats, pigs, and even fruit flies to understand aspects of our biology that we have in common. So, what model organism would you use to study genetic rescue?